we need to grasp what it means, this large blue void, the Pacific Ocean. It's considered the blue heart of our planet for the fact of its services. It produces significant amount of our oxygen and absorbs about a third of all of mankind's carbon dioxide. We hold 25% of the world's languages in this vast blue space. Papua New Guinea itself speaks over 800 different languages. The entanglement has always about who dominates the narratives and imagination of this space. Through the eyes of those who have colonized it, the Spanish explorer described it as peaceful and calm. The US military and certain former colonizers saw it as the theater of war. What does it mean to have had over 300 nuclear weapons tested up in the Marshall Islands, in the Middle Pacific in Kiribati, and further down south in French Polynesia or Tahiti? The United States of America and the United Kingdom just saw this vast space where there were very few people. It didn't matter. But if you've ever been to the Marshall Islands and you've ever sailed through many of these atolls, scales do matter. But if you want to look at it from an intergenerational perspective, the trauma of how those atomic bombs were tested, the people of the Marshall Islands still carry the burden of those nuclear tests in their genetic coding system. I want to introduce the new narrative around the Pacific Ocean, around resources, the blue economy, and introduce deep sea mining. But in the Pacific, we were one of those leading countries to issue licenses within our territorial waters and EZs. So at the moment, I think there are 30 contracts in the clariton Clipperton zone, areas beyond national jurisdiction. And with the scales of about 1.5 million square kilometers of ocean floor that's now currently held either by transnational corporations or governments. The contest for minerals is quite interesting. The, the narrative is that they will come from the ocean floors. It's the new frontier of a gold rush. Um, and it's really minerals supposedly to help us transition into a greener economy. The reality is that there is enough minerals from land-based mining. There is enough minerals that can be recycled to create circular economies and to transition. And I want to end with an amazing story from a navigator. So we were in the Marshalls last year and we met with him and we said to him, how do you navigate? But he said, when we are in training, the elders would just throw us into the water and they would say, feel the land. It's a sense that you develop. But he said, you really become attuned to feeling land, depending on where they throw you in the ocean. If it was from the seaside, or if you're from inner reef side, the currents will speak to you about where land is. And it matters to have those senses because when you're out in the real darkest of nights, you can miss those islands. You come from a landlocked country and you first go to an atoll. It's a phenomenal feeling because you almost feel like you're just floating on water. And yet in these spaces that people live in, particularly Kiribati, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands that have these coral atolls, they understand climate emergency and existential threat every day of their lives. The rising sea levels, they understand it. Coral bleaching, they get it. So I wanna really come back to Pacific futures. Where do we go from here? And just to really locate that there is an oceanic worldview 
where do we go from here with such entangled narratives, both again, political, economic, military, social, cultural, and environment frameworks. If the ocean is the heartbeat of our planet, we now need eyes that can hear the heartbeat of the ocean. We need ears that can fathom the depths of the ocean and what it offers all of us.